unfairly and, and uh, inaccurately. What I mean by that is that Amos and Hosea and Isaiah were condemning things like the, the use of false scales, where, where someone would um, cheat the poor out of uh, proper payment for what they were, were selling. Right? So that, that's, in, that's breaking a law. What that's about is enforcing the law equally for the rich as well as the poor. And that's very important, and I, I'm all in favor of that. Um, another thing that they are, they are concerned about is things like um, when, you see your neighbor, when you see your neighbor in need, you share with him. And this is what we call in the Jewish and Christian tradition acts of mercy. Um, um, it's charity. Um, it's not justice. Justice and charity are, are not the same thing. And, and I think what happens in the social justice tradition and something like the, if you've seen the social justice Bible, you know, the number of verses in the Bible that are related to social justice. Everything is, is about social justice. Well, justice is important, but justice isn't the same as charity. Charity is something that needs to be... Uh, the social justice movement often almost denigrates charity. It's a, eh, charity, you know, that's just hit and miss. You depend on charity and, you know, people might... And people could starve and might, because nobody's charitable to them. We can't have that. Um, so instead of putting the emphasis on encouraging those who have to share with those in need, there is a desire to, to take away individual responsibility and create a system where it can't, go, it can't fail but to, to make everyone have enough in need. The third thing I would say that it, about the social justice tradition in the Old Testament and the social justice tradition that is, uh, that is uh, talked about today is that, is that in the Bible, Clearly, uh, when you see someone who does not have either food or clothing or shelter, that um, it's a very strong injunction. In fact, it's proof of the reality of your faith that you help them. Uh, pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this, that to, to visit the widows and orphans in their, in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. This is not a, uh, an option for Christians. This is a very heavy obligation. However, to make sure that people have uh, the basic necessities of life is different than social leveling and being concerned about the, the disparity in the gap between the income of the richest and the income of the poorest. From a social justice perspective, what I was critiquing in the, in the lecture, if you said, okay, we're going, to, we're going to double the wealth of the lowest 10% in society, okay? We've got a, we got a plan. This is, this is, we're going to double it, right? But the wealth of the top 5% is going to quadruple at the same time. According to the way that social justice thinking goes, that would be more unequal than the current status quo. And I, I have a problem with that because social leveling is a valid perspective to have if you want to have that point of view and defend that point of view. But I don't think that's what the Old Testament prophets were necessarily saying. I do think it can become scandalous when rich people have so much and don't share with the, with the poor. And in that case, we need a more prophetic denunciation of them. They need to know where they're going. And we know from the Bible where that is, and it places hot. But that's different than saying the government should become the one that controls everyone's economics and decides how much the professional class and the business class will be allowed to keep and how much the poor will have and how much everybody will have, as if all the wealth of the society belonged to the government and was the government's to dole out according to its lights. That's a different thing. That's, that is what people call social justice. Um, I often think that uh, justice is, is important in terms of equality of treatment before the law. That's important. But equality of treatment before the law will not produce the results that the people who talk about social justice want to, to see happen. You see the difference between what, I'm, what I'm, I'm for and what I'm against? You don't have to agree, but <laughs> at least if we can get, get clarity. That's another question or whatever. In the, the brown sweater, you were next. I've been involved with uh, education in my entire life and uh, been a teacher and administrator. Um, I feel that the uh, schools are at a point where uh, 
they are in effect being used against Christianity and all that we stand for. Um, the, our schools are now oriented towards social change rather than transmitting the culture. And part of that is, for example, the United Nations Human Rights Agenda being promoted over our own Bill of Rights. And I see that as a huge problem. I'm wondering if from your standpoint that same type of thing has happened in Canada. Hmm. Do I see the same thing happening in Canada? Have you seen it? Have you I? seen it happening? Oh, you bet your boots. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, yes, um, the purpose of education for most, most educators is, um, uh, well, you know, in Canada we say that uh, kooky ideas are in California, uh, and then 10 years later they're in Toronto, and then 10 years later they're in New Brunswick. That's, uh, that's kind of how it goes in Canada, um, as far as educational fads go. But, um, um, yes, um, I think that there has been a serious shift in the pedagogical ideal from uh, wanting to, um, to educate children in the fundamentals of um, the academic disciplines that you need in order to succeed in life and transmitting the heritage of Western culture. Western culture is despised by, by people who are ideologues of social justice. Western culture is seen as inherently evil, oppressive, and, uh, and that liberation consists of getting free of social, of Western culture and Western ideals. So that, um, and the purpose of education is to transform people in a liberating direction, which means basically to empower individuals so that they are able to freely choose their own self-directed life projects, choose their own values, and create themselves according to however they want to by the exercise of their will. And that is, um, that is where education is going, and, and recognizing that is something that Christians have to do, and Christians can stand against it in many ways, um, but, it's, um, but fundamentally, there is something, um, I do think, you know, and, and I, I don't expect everyone to agree with me, but I do believe that Western civilization for all of its flaws, for all of its shortcomings, for all of its sins, which you would expect from any human thing, nevertheless has introduced into the world, uh, I think I define Western civilization as a creative synthesis of Greek philosophy at its best and biblical theology and a, and a, and a conversation, as McIntyre's phrase, an extended conversation over time embedded in institutions about the good life and the virtues. Um, I think that Western civilizations make contributions to the world that are permanent, of permanent value, and that need to be, uh, re need to be um, taught and upheld and, and maintained. I also think that we may be at the point where, that, that Alistair McIntyre, that at a certain point in time, uh, we as Christians may realize we've reached that similar point. I do think that, um, that the, uh, the night is, is falling on Western civilization, and uh, as a Canadian, I hope I can say this without um, being accused of being a hyper-American uh, or something, uh, because I'm not an American, but I believe that America is the last stand of the West. I believe that this is a, the last center-right country in which, uh, in which the heritage of the West is, is expressed uh, forcefully in public life, where the majority of the population is still conservative. And I do believe that, we, that, that uh, I, although I don't think that the West is the Roman Empire, I don't think it is the kingdom of, uh, America is not the kingdom of God. America is not uh, um, the dawning of the kingdom of God. It's not perfect. But I do think that America is, um, um, I had a student write to me recently asking my advice on a doctoral dissertation that had to do with T.F. Torrance and liberation theology. And I tried to be polite, and I answered, and, I re and it, it talked about and how we, you know, developing resources so that we can critique the, the, uh, the, um, the negative results, the negative impact of, of capitalism and the West upon the world and colonialism and, and so on and so on. And I did say that, I did reply, reply back to the student as politely as possible, but I did say I was getting tired of the Obama World Apology Tour and that uh, I think America has done enough penance um, America needs to realize that America has done a lot of good in the world as well as a lot of bad. And um, uh, from, my, from my perspective, if America 
declines if American military power disappears and the American influence as the world's only superpower ends tomorrow, then that power vacuum will be filled by something. And, I, and as far as I can see from my little vantage point in Canada, uh, all the candidates for filling that power vacuum are far less benign than the influence of American power in the world over the past half a century. So I say that as somebody who has imbibed anti-Americanism with my mother's milk and who has uh, uh, always been a part of a country where we are very anti-American because we, we live next door to the elephant as the mouse and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy to do that when every time you, when you're in bed with the mouse and the elephant are in bed together, uh, all the elephant has to do is roll over and it's the end of the mouse and so the mouse is always quite alert as to what's going on with the elephant and whereas the elephant can ignore the mouse. So coming from that kind of a perspective, I do really think that uh, that America has, um, I, don't, I'm not gonna, I don't want to sacralize America. I don't want to say this is, oh, it's, God, it's not God's last hope. Ah, God's got Africa. For all we know, God could have China. Um, God's, God isn't going to be worried if he loses America. But I, th I think Canada should be worried. And I think that um, I think the world will be worse off. So, uh, so um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Carr. I'm afraid that's the end of our time, but maybe if you have a few minutes, if people have additional questions, you could be here at the front and um, answer those. Uh, just one observation, if, if I may be permitted, is you talk about darkness descending. We remember the Reformation Memorial in Geneva, post-Tenebris Luke's, after the darkness light. Maybe the Lord, if darkness is descending, would be... Uh, good enough to grant us light before the descent of the darkness or in the midst of it that we might dispel it by his grace through the gospel. Upcoming events I'd like to announce that the Henry Center will be sponsoring here at Trinity October the 20th and 22nd the continuation of our Timothy series in which we bring uh, pastors, seasoned pastors, wise pastors to campus to interact with students and speak at length about pastoral ministry. Josh Moody, the new pastor at College Church in Wheaton, will be on campus for that purpose. And I think the students should look very much forward to that. Uh, our scripture and ministry lecture series will continue. We're done for the fall, but in the winter, uh, January the 20th, Richard Mao, president of uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, will speak on confessions of an evangelical pietist. And then March the 17th, uh, take that date down, Christine Paul Asbury Seminary, Practicing Hospitality in Troubled Times, Promise and Peril for the Church. Uh, next year we have coming Ajith Fernando, Dallas Willard, and Alice Trebeg, among others. So it's an exciting uh, future for uh, lectures and other events that the Henry Center will be sponsoring. Well, let's close our time by looking to the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, politics seems to be a bigger and bigger issue in our lives and in the world today. And we pray that as we search the scriptures, you would enable us to think wisely and to think carefully about the role of politics, about the role of the state, and about the role of the church, and about our role, God, of doing the work of an evangelist as faithful heralds of the truth that was once for all delivered to the saints. We thank you for Dr. Carter's ministry among us this afternoon. We pray, God, that you would grant him grace as he perseveres in that ministry. We pray that you would lead him in the directions that would please you and cause him to be most useful in your hands. And God, we pray that you would be honored in all the things that have been said and done this afternoon. And we ask it all in the name of our glorious Redeemer, even in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.